There, I'll go ahead. Let's see. That sounds pretty good. Crank that up just a little bit, if you would. There we go. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming today. That's too hot, Bobby. I'm sorry. I'm playing, I'm playing just down one little notch. Yeah. Those of you who went to the breakfast yesterday, Katie said there was nine. Thank you for going. Brother Mark was out of town. I do not ever have to work on Saturday. As the laziest man, I know this is good. However, the COVID explosion, they said you've got to work this Saturday. So I'm glad I was there because it was running out the door. We were there for hours, uh, much more than I wanted to be. But I, I'm sorry I wasn't able to come. I plead uh, pandemic-related excuses, which were genuine. You know if food was related and I wasn't there, it was a near-death experience for me. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for going and thank you for planning these things. And we'll, we'll try to get cranked back up more and more. Uh, we have lots of nice uh, ladies involved in this now, so and we all love food, so hopefully this next year we'll get back on track with our class activities. Our missionary of the week is uh, Cindy Ann Reskina in India. We've been supporting them since uh, 2000, and of course uh, her husband Harry died two years ago, and she is very uh, committed to continuing the ministry. You can read about this on the back. They have had a, a wonderful last 27 years, all sorts of church plants, and we've supported them. We, we get wonderful letters from them. I love Indian people. We, we support children, you know, through the uh, uh, deaf ministry, through bio. Before that, I used to support uh, Compassion International, and one of the children that we've supported since she was five years old uh, is now 27 and a nurse in Delhi there. And so I've never met her here on earth. I look forward to meeting her. Uh, her name is Sujitha Latha, and she's part of our family. And I do look forward to meeting her one day, even though I don't plan on going to India. I might go to India. God might send me there. But either way, we can have a presence in India through our Face Promise missions and uh, supporting people like Cindy Ann and like Sujitha Latha. Well, look in Genesis chapter 2. We are in our second lesson of an uh, incredible number. I think there's 52 of these. We're going to break them up and not do them straight through. Uh, people that are in the series by Dr. John Phillips from Moody Bible Institute called Exploring the People of the Bible. Last week was Adam. Who's today? Three guesses, first two don't count. Eve, of course, is today. Uh, last week we learned about Adam. The title of the uh, message today is Eve the mother of all. Question, were you impressed with Adam last week? Well, remember what my grandmother said. She said, when God made man, he was just practicing. This is the summa bonum of humanity is Eve. She is a wonderful person. We'll meet her. She fell like we would have. A sadness entered her life. But still, Jerry Vines, to quote him, says, Eve was fair as the morning, bright as the day, warm as sunshine, sweet as honey on the comb, the sum and substance, the very essence of womanhood. She was brimful and running over with life, and her husband ever and always lost his heart when he saw her. He, did, he followed her into sin, which was wrong, but still, in a human sense, that shows the depth of commitment which they were to have. And uh, just like Adam was the most handsome man except your husband that you've ever seen or thought of in your life, so was Eve, uh, one of the most beautiful women we've ever seen. He wrote here, she had the most grace, the most charm, the most wit, the most personality, the most charisma, the most appeal. I thought of women that I like on, in movies, like Grace Kelly. I thought she was just beautiful and a, just a, a very charming. Catherine Hepburn, I could hear her talk all day. Audrey Hepburn, my daughter, Rebecca, loves Audrey Hepburn because I gave her, she kind of looked like her, like a little elf. And I always thought a lot of both Catherine and, uh, and Eve Arden. I thought she was the most uh, sharpest lady in radio and movie back in the 50s and 60s. Well, you have yours, but they are, uh, with all due respect, nothing compared to Eve. Eve was the woman, and she is. Uh, number one, I want you to see about Eve, uh, Eve's future. You say, her future? Why don't you talk about her past? She had no past. <laughs> I delivered babies from... Uh, 86 to maybe 89, just to three or four years at UT. We delivered lots of babies. Most of them were uh, teenagers that uh, was their first baby, so it was a little bit difficult. 
Uh, but here's one thing that never happened. In the delivery room, there was never any policeman with a warrant for that baby. Because babies are all future, no past. You could claim that on your life, nobody would believe it. But in East's case, it was true. She was a woman who was all future and no past. I met my wife in 1984. We were married in 85. And uh, when you met the one that was to be your wife, uh, you wanted to know what her background was, what her dreams for the future were, what she was doing now. She was tripartite, past, present, and future. Adam had no such uh, worries about that. Eve was all future. As a matter of fact, let me take a little time to read uh, about 30 verses here. And, and a lot of what we know about Eve begins in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. The Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I'll make an help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called that living creature, that was the name thereof. Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air, the beast of the field. But Adam looked through there and checked his list twice. There was not found an help meet for him. This is the first sadness. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. He slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, Adam is very, very happy. Immediately he knows this is exactly who and what he needed. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. In Hebrew, man is ish and woman is isha, and she is taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife. They shall be one flesh. They were both naked, the man and the wife, and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent looked at her square in the eyes and said, You won't die. You will not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, literally as Elohim, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree, she considered this, was good for food, to be desired, to make one wise, pleasant to the eyes, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with him, and he did eat, and the eyes of them were opened, like he said, but instead of being good, it was bad. They knew they were naked, they sewed fig leaves together, made themselves aprons, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and he said, Adam, where art thou? This wasn't for information. He knew where he was. He said, uh, Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I, I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, who told you that I was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree that I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man looked around and did what my grandchildren do every week and said, the woman you gave me. In other words, number one, it's not my fault. It's the woman's fault. And as a matter of fact, I believe I have a receipt here that you are the one that brought this woman into my life. Immediately, Adam's eyes are going like this. In one verse, it's not my fault. It's that woman's fault. As a matter of fact, it's not even her fault. It's your fault, God. That's the idea. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, I did eat. It's never anybody's fault, whether you're a CNN or Fox News people. It's not your fault. Somebody else's fault. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me that I did it. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. The serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. It was absolutely nobody's fault. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you've done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and every beast of the field upon thy belly. Thou shalt go, and dust shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head. Thou shalt bruise his heel. Under the woman, he said, back to my story about delivering babies, teenage girls are not really ready to have babies, but... 
they have to, uh, in sorrow. And, thy, thy, and thy, thy, under the women I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. Unto Adam he said, because you have hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat it all the days of thy life. Uh, ladies, in the OBGYN department and having children, you're going to be miserable now. Men going out to earn uh, food or bring it home by the gift of God, now it's going to be a horrible labor and sweat and misery. Thorns also... <coughs> and thistles thou shalt bring forth to thee, to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of thy field, and the sweat of thy face shall thou eat thy bread until thou return unto the ground. For out of it thou was taken, thou art dust, and unto dust thou shalt return. Well, it's gone bad in half a chapter, but Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was mother of all the living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God made coats of skin, and clothe them, and God said, Behold, the man is now become as one of us, to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth, out of here, go, gone from the Garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. And he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way, to keep the way of the tree of life. You met your wife again, and you wanted to know about her past, and she wanted to tell you, here's where I'm from, here's what I do. And, and you share that. That's exciting to learn about each other. Uh, but here is an altogether yet-to-be woman. And things could have been very, very good. And they still were. But sin entered so quickly into their life. Uh, number one the thing to learn about Eve's future was her maker, God, was her maker. May I pleasantly tell you that here theistic evolution again jams its gears. Where did Eve come from? Did she also, over billions of years, by random chance, absolutely perfectly become a woman who walked up to Adam at exactly the same time, 2.30 on Thursday? He's ready to procreate. She's ready to procreate. Both of them random creations. If, she, if he bent down to tie his shoes, he had no shoes, that's a joke, uh, she would have walked right by and there would have never been any children. And you believe this. Now, I can't believe that you really believe this. I hope you don't. That is the now traditional view of creation, is that there's no creation, that there is a random conglomeration of atoms from particles to people and from molecules to men and to women and it happened over billions of years and completely randomly. And more than that, just one man being created that way, a woman walked up that way with a completely different body. And they fit together perfectly as far as being able to procreate further. And all this happened randomly. And this is passing for wisdom in our public school system and the state universities of our land. Uh, uh, through a thousand convolutions to appease the shifting hand sands of human science, so-called, uh, that tries to convince us that Adam, if he existed, was produced by God actually through evolution directly or indirectly somehow. What about Eve? Another one, completely randomly, and yet they meet and have children and perfectly in tune down to the second, even though billions of years are involved otherwise. That's not going to happen. That would not happen simultaneously. That wouldn't happen contemporaneously contemporaneously there is no way the Bible more accurately or completely accurately said she was taken out of Adam's side in a special dawn of time process directed by the Lord God of heaven guess what you've got to pick I'm talking to new Christians here if there are any in the room you can't drag your traditional random evolution into your new Christian life. You've got to jettison that. Because once you tell me in Genesis chapter 2 and 3 that black ink on white paper does not mean what it says, then the rest of the Bible is out the window. You have, it has no authority in your life. You have got to pucker up or duck. <laughs> you have got to make a decision. Either 
creation was as God who cannot lie and knows everything says, or it wasn't, and if Genesis 2 and 3 aren't true, why is John 3, 16 true? You need to be honest, get in your boat, and go out in the lake on the weekend and forget this because you're just playing with yourself and you're going to just destroy your mind by trying to hold simultaneously two things that are mutually exclusive. Jerry Vine says, either the Bible account of creation is true or it's false. There is no other choice. Our world in many areas doesn't like binary choices. You've heard that now. Guess what? Too bad. It's either true or or false. If evolution is in fact true, then the Bible account begins with a gross and excusable mistake. Both views can't be true. This is either fact or fable. I've had dinner three times with Dr. Adrian Rogers. One time, the first time, was at the, uh, the place in Gatlinburg where they, Apple Barn. He was going to speak at a deacon's retreat for uh, Calvary Baptist Church there in Knoxville. And they said, do you want to go? I said, of course I want to go. That'd be great. And they put me sitting right next to him, and it was just wonderful. Somehow it turned to creation and evolution. He said, fellas, only two choices. I'll simplify for you this now. Number one, God made man. Or number two in the theory of evolution, man made God. We just, it's a concept that we make up to describe random evolution. He said, there is no other choice. Uh, Genesis 1, we are told that creation was good and very good until uh, there a not good enters Genesis 2.18. It is not good that man should be alone, that I'll make a help meet for him. The first thing that was not good in the perfect creation of God was the, the time frame between the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve. I've been married 37 years. A lot of you have been married, according to your records, 137 years. So I'm a newbie, I know, compared to you. But your wife goes away from the weekend. How do things go? Not well. Not well. Lots of things that happen every Saturday or Wednesday, and you come home and everything's going fine. Apparently, there's been more going on than you thought. It is not good to be alone. And women the same, but more so with men. It is just you don't do very well. And you know what? God knew that. There was no sin involved and kindly and wisely God went out and from Adam's side made his masterpiece human 2.0 woman. Isha. That's the idea. Matthew Henry said in his commentary of Eve that God took her from Adam's side not from his head to rule over him, not from his feet to be trampled by him, but by his side to be his equal in worth protected by his arm and loved by his heart. That Matthew Henry had a way with words. He's exactly right. And you know what? From Adam's point of view, I mean, I had that surgery a couple of years ago. It was a four-hour surgery. You know what it was to me? Nothing. I was laying there telling jokes to the anesthesiologist, and then shazam, I'm in the recovery room, and he said, well, I'm sorry, that was a long surgery. I said, didn't seem long to me. You know what? Same way. Adam, a deep sleep fell on him. Out of his side, God created Eve, and to Adam, it was a shazam moment. One moment, there is no woman. The next moment, she is standing before him, fresh from the hand of her maker. No past, all future. Number one, Eve's future. The first point, her maker. Number two, her marriage. Uh, people can get married too quick. People can wait too long. Uh, I very young when I got married and we met in August of 84 and we got married in April of 85 and so just seven or eight months and it's worked out great you just not 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 right or wrong on that but you just have to do wisely but this by any accounts was a lightning swift courtship you talk, I was eight months that's slow compared to Adam and Eve because they were a maid and created and then they were made for each other and there was no sin to worry about and no background checks to do because neither of them had any background and they knew they were right for each other because there was nobody else and Adam introduced uh, God introduced Adam to Eve she was not tempted by any other men he was not confused by any other women the straight up they met they married just like that and instantly Adam's paradise became a double paradise the Lord Jesus Christ believed this was a real historical record 
You say, I'm not sure about that. You didn't hear me. The Lord Jesus Christ believed this was a real historical record. And Jesus Christ, uh, being God, bears the marks of God in omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. He knows everything, and everything he knows is exactly true. And if Jesus Christ, throughout the New Testament, uh, portrays Adam and Eve as real historical creatures, and the Genesis record is absolute fact, you should too. Well, you're being bossy. No, you just should. You can't find your keys. I can't balance the checkbook. And yet we're going to tell God, well, I have a different theory. God goes, mine's right. I don't even need to hear your theory. It's right. The Lord Jesus says in Matthew 19, verses 1 through 8, it came to pass that when Jesus finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee, came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. Great multitudes followed him. He healed them there. And the Pharisees were there. And they, uh, tempting him, they said unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Their answer was yes. They hated, if their wives burned the toast, they wanted them gone. They were mean, mean men. Jesus answered them, and he said this every time to the Pharisees, because the Pharisees had memorized the Old Testament. But Jesus said, you know the music, but you can't carry the tune. You can read the notes, but you can't sing the song. And Jesus, all through the New Testament, it's the best thing. He says, have ye not read? That stung them so bad because their one claim to fame in Israel was that they had read and memorized and knew every word. They knew the words. They didn't know what it meant. Jesus said, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning, creation presented as a fact without stutter, without stammer, without equivocation, no blinking, no looking side to side. Jesus said, God made them at the beginning, made them male and female, Oh, that binary stuff. It won't go away, will it? You're either male or female. Oh, how distressing. Too bad. Too bad on the authority of who said it. And said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, the twain shall be one flesh. Therefore, they're no more two, but one flesh. What God, therefore, hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And they said, well, then why did Moses command to give a writing of divorcement to put her away? He said, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you uh, to put away your wives. But from the beginning, Genesis chapter 2 and 3, it was not so. That was not the intent of the heart of God. Do you see Jesus is presenting these references as absolutely historical and absolutely authoritative? You say, well, we're going to have a debate on that. You can have it, but after it's through, Jesus is presenting these events as absolutely historical and absolutely authoritative. You say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about a lot of things that are true, but this also is true, and you should try to believe everything the Bible clearly teaches. It will be a lot easier on you and a lot easier on me. Don't rush by this. Jesus Christ believed in a literal Adam and Eve. There is no literary construction or interpretation of these that makes them myth, saga, legend, or poetry. You cannot do it. You say, well, are you a literary expert? I'm not. I'll tell you who was. Uh, C.S. Lewis was. That's what he did. He was the professor of medieval and renaissance literature and then the professor of English at Oxford. And he said, I know literary forms. This is bare fact presented objectively you've got to tell and present Jesus Christ as being in error to get around the creation of man and woman that there was only man and woman they were made for each other and what God has put together let no man uh, split apart you know what today in 2022 the traditional view of creation is random evolution you are the radicals when you present the view that by special creation, Adam was made out of the dust of the earth and Eve was made out of Adam's side. You're not the traditionalist. That's the traditionalist, and we are the ones that are giving the radical, heaven-sent interpretation. You cannot drag into your new relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ all that old stuff. And again, I told you last week, I, from 1978 to 1982, I have a 
degree in biology from the University of Missouri, there was not a creationist within 100 miles of that place. I mean, four years I was indoctrinated with evolutionary biology, and I have had to unwind that, but that was a long time ago, and I have. But there's no need to be that dumb. I just happened to be in, in the biology world, and they debated evolution every day, and I had to unwind it. There's no need, though, to get in that mess. It is unthinkable that anyone who claims to be a Christian could look at Jesus Christ and say, you say you're omniscient, but I think you're wrong. Well, I think you're wrong. It comes Christ versus you as far as intellectual authority. I'm going with Christ. Do you blame me? Again, you, your tires are half flat. You don't know what your accounts are in, in, in First People's Bank or your mail order accounts. You can't find your credit card. You tie your shoes wrong half the time, and you're going to tell me that you're looking at Christ and saying, you're wrong, and I'm right. I don't think so. Uh, that was the idea. When the disciples asked the Lord his teaching on divorce, he went back to the f roots and the foundation of creation, beyond the prophets, beyond the law, back to the Garden of Eden, back to the first wedding. God, as God was there himself and officiated at that wedding, both as the father of the bride and the friend of the bridegroom, divorce has its roots in human wickedness and hardness because we are. We get tangled up and sometimes that happens. But marriage has its roots in divine love from the very, very beginning. In Mark chapter 10 and uh, verse 9, it says, What God hath therefore joined together, let no man put asunder. So mark this. Eve was created, and Eve was married. Modern world tells women, you weren't created, you're a random act of nothingness. And marriage is bondage and just a subjugation, and you should run from it and be yourself. You've got to split right away about, now I'm not a woman, but that is a very clear choice you have to make as to uh, what goes on. Eve had before her... If she had walked with God as she should have, and I'm not blaming her because we would have done just as badly, an eternity of bliss in an unending earthly paradise. Uh, ideal real estate, wonderful surroundings. You like to garden? That's the initial plan of the heart of God is take care of living things, take care of growing things, green things, animals, things like that, tending Eden, keeping Eden, you like animals, you're an animal person, you're not any more than Eve was. The beasts knew who uh, they loved. I mean, my, my little dogs love me, but when mama comes home, oh, I can just see their tails headed across the room because that, she is the one. Well, Eve is the one. Fruits and flower, beasts and birds, tame, submissive, wonderful, wide, rivers to explore, forest to roam, surprise, delight, variety, joy, Days of wonder, nights under a starry sky, and in the evening, every evening in the cool of the day, a walk with the creator and intender of all this, the God of heaven, with her husband, Adam, to talk with them, to walk to them, to open up both new and marvelous mysteries of the handiwork in heaven and in earth. It would have been wonderful. Number one, Eve's future, her maker, her marriage. Number two, Eve's fall. Immediately after Genesis 2, very quickly, uh, Satan shows up. And the serpent was none other than Lucifer, and he waited until Eve was alone. I heard Charles Stanley talk about one time about, you know, sin just doesn't happen in the vacuum. Your circumstances make you at risk for temptation and sin. You say, what do you mean? Well, even in human psychology, I've heard this before, uh, but have you heard the acronym HALT, H-A-L-T? HALT means that when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, you're more likely to commit sin. You are. If you get home and get 20 minutes of a good meal and get hydrated and talk to those you love and they're there with you, you're not likely to go out and just do wrong. But when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired... Uh, you are much more likely to give in to temptation. Well, Satan knows that. He's brighter than me, and he got her alone. I don't know why she was alone. The Bible doesn't tell, but it's not good. 
The Bible old, uh, unmasked this old serpent for us. Three chapters into the Bible, we meet the serpent. Three chapters from the end of the Bible, we meet him from the last time. First time, last time, and in between, his evil is exposed, explained, and explored. Before his fall, we learn about Satan who found Eve in Genesis chapter 3, that he was the anointed cherub, gifted, glorious, uh, great and gorgeous choir, choir master of heaven. He still is incredibly brilliant and intelligent. But after his falls, he uses his gifts for twistedness, and now his soul is soured by sin and hatred for God who would not let him be in charge. He is driven by implacable hatred of God, and because he can't hurt God, he hurts those who are in God's image and hurts God's heart himself. To hurt you, to ruin your marriage, to ruin your family, to ruin your children, for sin to ruin your life, doesn't hurt God except the loving heart of God is injured, but it hurts those made in the image of God and made by the hand of God and loved by the heart of God. God is too much for Satan, but man made in the image of God, yes, what a target. That's pretty cruel. You can't hurt your neighbor because he or she's a retired military and they, they know how to handle people like you, but you can hurt their children. That's pretty low as far as I'm concerned, but not any lower than Satan. Uh, to deface the image of God would be a sweet revenge. Graf if, you, if you're a, a low living person and you couldn't build anything and you come up to a beautiful statue or a beautiful building, you can't tear it down. You can't even build something that would look like it, but you can take your spray paint and put graffiti all over it. That's what, that's what Satan does. On the surface, Eve would seem to be no match for this level of wisdom in an evil way. She knew nothing of sin. Her armor was innocent. She just did what God said. God had intended her to be the heart of this new creation. Adam working with her was to be her protector and to, to defend her. He had created, ordained, and commissioned Adam to be the head, not Eve. But Eve was a brilliant person. Her IQ was much higher than you or I were. Where was Adam? That's the cry in America today as far as husbands and especially fathers. Where are the men? Now, I'm talking to good men here, and we have good families. We're not, we're, not, we're not perfect, but we know that this is what we are called to be. We are to be, be there in marriage and be there in families and be there for your children and grandchildren. Where was Adam? Question, not only where was Adam, why didn't Eve call for him? She says, oh, here's a situation that my husband and I need to work together. He needs my, you know, women's intuition is right. You can learn that at your, it may take you a while. I hired one guy to work for us 20 years ago. My wife said, that, something's wrong with that guy. I'll tell you right now, something is bad wrong with him. I said, well, here's the, the uh, notes that we've had and we've had the, uh, the background, the hospital checked on him and everything's okay. She said, well, something's wrong with him. Something was wrong with him. <laughs> Within a month, I thought, why in the world didn't I listen to my wife? But she also asked me things and I have input that helps her too. That's the idea. Every word of God was her weapon, just like for us. She only had two words from God. Her Bible was very small. It was in Genesis chapter two. Verses 16 and 17 is all that God had said on this matter. God said of every tree of the garden thou must freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for in the day thou eat thereof thou shalt surely die. When Satan said take this, Eve could have said, God says I shall not touch that, and if I eat it I will die. That's all she had to do, and stand on it and not back up, and God was very clear. It was enough, it was sufficient, and even though Eve was smarter than us, it's not a matter of intelligence. She should have stood on the inspired, inerrant, invincible word of the truth that God gave them in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, and Lucifer would have fled. She wouldn't have won an intellectual battle, but she would have won a battle. I have bad news. Eve didn't do very well. Don't you look down on her. You would have done worse. She did not do well. She handled the word, but she handled it clumsily uh, she misquoted the word. She added to it once and subtracted from it twice and tried to paraphrase. But still, she did better than some of us would have done. There are many sons and daughters of Eve in this. 
you try to finagle the Bible around to sort of fit the word of the day. Some interpretations are like that. Some Bibles are just paraphrases. And if you read them as paraphrases, that's okay, but they're not authoritative. The Living Bible is like that. It just kind of uses modern English to give kind of the sense of what's going on. As long as you're not presenting that as God's word, it may be okay. But it's a little bit dangerous because the Bible is every word out of the mouth of God. And you really need a good translation for that. Uh, th this is the idea. Ease fall. Number one, the challenge. If you don't hear anything else today, hear this. Uh, Satan challenged Eve and the authority of the Bible along three lines. Number one, the authorship of the word. Genesis 3.1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yay, let's see. Are you sure about this? Hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Isn't the Bible the uh, ongoing record of the Hebrew people and the philosophical thoughts of a wandering Jew named Jesus? Is it authoritative for today? Are you sure that God said this, whatever God is or he or she is? I'm not sure about this. You know what? That is pumped into every state university and unfortunately a lot of so-called Christian universities today. They are not sure about whether God has spoken. They're going to have a dialogue and a conversation. Conversation is a great word, but it irritates me now because instead of plain black and white, now we're supposed to debate everything. You can't live like that. That's not true. Dryden, the poet, uh, answered this. Uh, let me give you a poem here in a second. Adrian Rogers says, anybody, anytime, anywhere that puts a question mark where God puts an exclamation mark is doing the work of the devil. He got that from Genesis 3. God gave us his word so that we can operate in truth and have a firm foundation. When you say, I'm not sure about that, you are doing wrong. You may not know you're doing wrong. I'm not saying you're demonic or anything, but you're aligning with the devil in Genesis 3. Dryden said this about the authority of the word. Whence from Whence but from heaven could men unskilled in arts, these are just regular fishermen and things, in different ages born from different parts, weave such agreeing truths, or how or why should all conspire to cheat us with a lie? When starving their gains, unwanted their advice, unmasked their pains, and martyred them their price. These were not scientists. How come every word of God fits together? Why did they die for these things if they weren't true? People will live for a lie, but they won't die for a lie. If you say, I'm going to kill you, if you don't retract that statement, they'll say, I'll retract it. The martyrs didn't. They believed this. Number one, Satan and people that are un unwittingly perhaps on his side today deny the author authorship of the word. Number two, deny the accuracy of the word. Hath God said? Are you sure a modern and more perhaps uh, intuitive uh, interpretation of this might go like this and we want to be uh, inclusive and have conversations and we might need to rework these words no this is vertical truth injected from heaven to earth but what you're challenged with by the world and by Satan is how do you know this is what God said it's a matter of preservation we believe that God will preserve his word and he has and you know what? You better stick with that or you are at sea without a ship or a compass on a dark and stormy night. You have got to believe that God has preserved his word for us. They say all you have is a broken, copy, copied, memory, damaged estimation that may not be accurate. We must have an accurate word from heaven or we're adrift. Number three, not only is the challenge to the authorship of the word and the accuracy of the word, but the acceptability of the word. Look in verse 6 of Genesis 3. The woman saw that it was good for food, that is the apple or the tree or the fruit, I guess, and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. And she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave to her husband and he did eat. And you know that's the, uh, not only to men but to women today and young and old, the world says, why would you live such a restricted life that you're going to narrow your beliefs down to what the Bible says? There's a bigger world out there. You know, they kind of run you down. And a teenage girl, this is very hard to, to fight. You know, they say, there is more to the world than this. Why do, you, why do you believe these narrow, old, misogynistic, anti-feminine, feministic, views you know you you are a woman you need to roar you know you need to have a big time 
and to follow this plan was so restricting and so limiting to you. And you know what, teenage young people, they, they're thinking, they're trying to think of what, it is a spiritual battle. I'm not making light of it. Haven't you been to school, they would say? And they, you know, that's, and scorn is pretty hard to deal with. Sarcasm is very rough. That's a, a choice tool in the devil's hand. Aren't you an intelligent, independent, modern girl that can think for herself? Why would you woodenly accept such an outdated, narrow restriction on your personal freedom and expression and behavior? This sounds so good. And that's what Satan said to Eve in the language of that day. But because Eve was weak in the word, she was easy prey for the tempter. One, one moment, think of Eve. Free, magnificent, God-obeying, Bible-believing, spirit-exalting, and within five minutes after turning from the God of heaven and what he said, she was a temptress to her husband instead of a help. She said, here, I've done something wrong. Why don't you do it too? At least we can do it together. You know people like that. When you do something wrong, you kind of want to make sure that everybody's doing that. It's no big deal. You try to draw everybody down to your new level. And that's what goes on here. A seducer ready to drag her nearest and dearest down to her level and ruin Adam's life. She would have never done that. That was never her intent. And it's sin does that in one minute. Uh, Jerry Vines says, what a tragedy. Not Jerry Vines, John Phillips wrote this part. John Phillips says, the sun still shone brightly in the sky. The flowers still breathed their perfume. Four rivers still flowed from Eden. All was the same, but everything was different. She looked up. The serpent was gone, but so was the light of the Holy Spirit out of Eve's soul. God no longer indwelt her spirit, and very swiftly, no longer indwelt Adam's spirit. She was much more as, as aware and focused on herself, and much more alive to the possibility of all kinds of sin and wickedness. A terrible shift took place that has ramifications in your life and my life and our family's life. You know what? You've done this when you've sinned. This is a big sin. Eve did not think it would be like this. She thought it would be a matter of her personal choices and her beauty, and everybody would think a lot of her, and she would be wise, and she would be a 2022 20, woman. It didn't work out like that. And now something wonderful is gone. The light is gone. It was frightening and fascinating. She began to scheme, and she was ashamed, scared, terrified, thought, oh, no, what about this evening when God comes? She wasn't looking forward to him coming anymore. God said, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What did that mean? Something had died within her. And every time we sin, something dies within us, and Christ has to make it alive again. Could Adam help her? What if he rejected her? What if the best plan was to maybe see if he would join her in this new miserable life? At least she would not be in it alone. Adam would have done the same thing the other way around. They both did that. Here's the change, not only the challenge, but the change. First, she looked at what she knew was wrong, and the look became lust. Some things just fly before you. You can't avoid them. But if you go back a second time, that's your choice. Dr. Rogers said, you, it may be that birds fly over your hair, but they don't need to form a nest in your head. You don't, you don't need to just dwell on them. The look became a lust. The desire became a decision. She held that fruit. She may have held it for a month. Time must have been different back then. Everything was going to change. Death was in her hand. She was toying with it. I think about that like drug addicts. I've never been a drug addict. I used to, college, I used to drink a lot, and that was bad enough, but... But drug addicts, you know, with that needle or something, they, if they, if they cry, or meth or something, that's, I've got maybe one patient in my life that ever got over meth. It is just absolutely just rips you apart. Not only the look became a lust, the desire became a decision, the choice became a chain because one choice leads to another choice leads to another choice. Uh, and really, it's still your choice. You say, well, she was in a bad shape. It wasn't her fault. She could have not sinned, and you and I could have not sinned. He can uh, purpose or pander to our temptations and wickedness, but it's still our choice. And finally, she spread this by becoming a seducer. People who are entangled in a web of evil habits, lust, and cravings will try to get other people involved to make it seem not so bad for her. That morning, Eve awoke in fellowship with the angels of God at peace with the world, 
uh, a daughter of heaven. That night she went to bed, a sinner, alive to the knowledge of both good and evil, a slave to sin, and a stranger to goodness. Well, the, time, the bell's ringing, but the last part, you can imagine, she hoped, she learned, that the only cure for this was that out of her, out of the seed of the woman, someone would come to destroy Satan. Uh, she thought it might have been Cain. It was not. He was a child of the devil. She thought it might have been Abel. He was better, but he was not the final prophet or the seed of the woman. Uh, but out of Seth, finally, that second line of Seth, the line of the seed of the woman that would come to be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, came forth. One of her hopes was that her boys would be the Messiah. She messed up the time. She didn't know that it was going to be much later. And then instead she birthed a murderous generation, which is our generation today. But within that generation, like a red line, like, a, like the line of the seed, Christ would come. And thank God he did. And we'll see Adam and Eve in heaven. They're no worse than us and we're no better than them. Uh, she was wrong about the time, but she was involved happily in the procurement and the uh, birth of the line of the seed. Well, these are complicated, but they're good. So there's Adam and Eve. Now, we're not going to just go through all the way uh, chronologically. We will bounce around some because each of these is meant to be a freestanding lesson. So we'll do some New Testament and Old Testament. Next week out of Ruth is Elimelech, if you want to read ahead. Uh, but Adam and Eve were good because I needed to, to, this is foundational by definition since it's at the beginning of the Bible. Lord, thank you today for our study on Eve and we look forward to meeting her. What a glorious woman and what a good woman. Uh, she became a sinner like us, but you died to save sinners and we look forward to seeing Adam and Eve and learning a lot from them in heaven. Amen. You know, I think, I don't know if I'm supposed to do this announcement or not. Terry Campbell says uh, there are items needed to borrow for our mission conference. If you have a large wooden cutting board or trays or tiered trays, uh, they would need them by February the 18th for our missions uh, conference, our global focus. Is that from you? Okay. Didn't hear? Let me try again. Anoint, uh, this is an announcement for ladies that uh, we're having a, uh, for our missions conference, they need uh, wooden cutting boards and tear trays to display the food and to try to get it uh, to Terry. Put your name on the bottom of those and they need them by February the 18th. 